Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar uh, organized in the frame of the EIT Food Project Ethic Chain, the authenticity of food with ethical and religious perspective. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for being here today, as well as the attendees for showing their interest in the webinar. I also want to thank, especially thank EIT Food for providing the funding uh, for, this, for making this uh, project possible and also for organizing this event. So I hope you find it interesting. The talks will be in English, but you will have the opportunity to listen to them in Spanish just by clicking the ES icon in your screen. Uh, also, uh, as stated in the agenda, we will have three talks. And if you have any questions, you can post them uh, in the chat and we will go back to them after the end of the third talk. In any case, any, uh, any of the questions remains unanswered due to the lack of time. We will reply them uh, by email to the specific uh, person who has posed the question. Uh, I will start presenting the first speaker, Dr. Miguel Angel Pardo. He is a principal investigator, researcher, sorry, uh, at ASTI in the Basque country, Spain. Uh, he is the head of the Molecular Biology Lab. He has worked in uh, a number of uh, national and international projects for the last 20 years, mainly related to the development of DNA analysis methods to detect ingredients, microorganisms, as well as parasites. He has published a, a lot of uh, papers and also he has a few patents. Please, Miguel Angel, the floor is yours. Elisa, for your kind presentation. As Elisa introduced myself, I'm Miguel Angel Pardo and I work in ASTI. Um, I would like to, to, it's a pleasure to me, give you this, this uh, presentation, focus on a identity and food safety and beyond uh, food flow. Uh, during the last years, as Elisa introduced myself, I'm working on the development of molecular methodologies for food authentication to identify the present or non-declared ingredients by addition, substitution of one ingredient by another, uh, ingredients and so on, with the final aim of deterring fraudulent practices. These fraudulent practices are economically motivated in most of the cases and directly results in the reduction of quality and affects consumers' pocket, producing a loss of confidence in food industry. This is, as you can imagine, this is a big concern, but the objective of this lecture is open your eyes to other implications beyond food fraud and quality. I mean, there are another implications like ethics of food safety, health uh, implications that will be keep in mind. I would like to start with a definition, because I think it's very important to de define the, 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 the terms. In this case, the Oxford Dictionary of English uh, uh, state that the identity is the condition or fact that the person or thing is itself and not something else. I would like to, to, put, uh, to give you an example. You can imagine, I'll lay, I'll, I, let me show you a, a simple fresh apple. This is an apple. A green apple is an edible fruit produced by an apple tree, Malus domestica. So this fruit, the identity of this fruit, we only think about the species, Malus domestica species. But in this case, is this apple belongs to a specific cultivated variety denominated Granny Smith. This variety is harvested in a specific region located in Italy that perfect symbiosis between the alpine climate and the Mediterranean sun. So you can include in the, in the label of this simple apple, these different uh, labels, like the Granny Smith and the Marlin region. Moreover, in this case, this apple has been recognized at the European level with a protective geographical indication, South Tyrolean apple PGI. 
the harvest of this apple keeps the integrity of the produce and respect for the environment with a biological label, organic and ecological production that says that this organic product and pesticide free. So this another label can be included. Clean label. We can also include this clean label because clean label refers to food products that have fewer ingredients. In this case, we you only have only only, a, only a one apple. So you can include this another label. Moreover, this apple is also safe because it's gluten free. It means that manufacturer has followed stringent steps to prevent gluten free cross contamination between different ingredients of products. It's transgenic free because it's not a genetically modified organism, so you can include that it's a, this apple is non-transgenic. Another, another label is the vegan, because as you know, an apple is a vegan product, and it's can be resisted a symbol for labeling vegan and vegetarian products and services. For consumers, it's a simple and reliable guide to help them when they are stopping. It's kosher. These apples are kosher because they were produced according to Jewish laws and ethics and halal according to Islamic businesses. Finally, attending to the nutritional characteristics, these apples don't contain fats, low cholesterol because have the length of 2 milligrams for cholesterol, no sugar, and the sodium content is also healthy. So this is the final picture and you can Imagine that only one apple can be labeled with this kind of different huge amount of attributes with only one apple. But this can be exponentially increased when you want to use this apple, for example, to cook a delicious apple pie with, another, with other ingredients such as the sugar from Brazil, maybe eggs from Spain, flour from Poland, cinnamon from China, and so on, and etc. So you can imagine the mess that can be uh, of, uh, we can, uh, the mess that we have had with different ingredients can come up from different regions of production system that must be taken into account to obtain reliable and safe products. Another definition I, that I would like to, to, to show you is what is food safety. Food safety is a scientific method discipline describing handling, preparation and storage of food in ways that prevent foodborne illnesses. How? By the prevent the detection of intentional or natural presence of additives, pesticides, antibiotics, hormones, radioactive isotopes, toxins, microorganisms like viruses, bacteria, parasites, allergens, and even the presence of biomolecules with healthy implications like lactose, glucose, fatty acids, and so on. With this slide, I would like to show you that, the, generally speaking, food fraud often results in the reduction of quality rather than safety. But in some cases, the fraudulent practices can affect or can result in complications to public health, food safety issues, since the ancient time. Until now. Now I would like to give you some uh, some history uh, uh, um, items because in the beginning of the 19th century, it was a rapid increase in the industrial preparation of packaging of foods. This drastic increase of additives used in, in mainly in, in Europe and in UK uh, specifically uh, became a serious health concern. In this century. Frederick Ockum was a very famous German chemist that nowadays is considered the first food forensic scientist, made important efforts to keep processed food free from dangerous additives. In this slide, you can see in the right that Eteratis, an adulteration of food book that was very successful in, 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 that, uh, in that age in, in, in London, where a huge amount of adulterations were made public in that publication. In this case, I, could, I would like to show you two, two, two cases. Uh, the presence of, of alum to increase the wideness of breath and enable them to use an inferior, the fraudulent use of an inferior flower to, 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 to obtain an economically uh, improved uh, gain, in this case, economic gain for the, for the breaths. Reader, sorry, 
and another example is the color anchovies with a vegetarian red dye containing lead because at that age was very uh, uh, important to obtain a red color in the anchovies. So this is two examples of you know, at that age that the people uh, introduce fraudulent practices and affect the health uh, of, of citizens. Now I would like to focus their attention in the last 15 years, and I would like to, to give you some uh, important food fraud incidents with severe implications for human health. In Spain, in 1981, the industrial grade rapeseed oil was illegally sold as olive oil to obtain an economic profit mostly in the, in the street markets from different cities of Spain. Uh, this very famous uh, incident uh, affected to more than 5,000 people, because th more or less uh, 5,000 people uh, have died over the years, and mostly uh, 2,000 thousand surviving victims with poor quality of life and incurable affliction was assessed after this uh, incident was a, a fraud incident that affect, uh, that produced a food illnesses. Another very famous sample is in, in some products made in China in 2008, where some products, dairy products, were deliberately adulterated with melanin. Melanin is a chemical used to make plastic that they had used to boost artificially the protein levels. So, Finally, you can obtain a high contents of protein in the milk, but not with milk, with, with added melanin. This uh, fraud affected 300,000 people, including babies. And the melanin rep event represents one of the largest deliberate food contamination incidents with global implication on food and feed safety uh, worldwide. Another example of food fraud that can affect and related, related with food safety uh, issues was in 2011, is the Escherichia coli uh, outbreak in Germany caused thousands of hospitalization and 53 deaths. In the beginning, the German officials, as is you, rem is you, is you remind, incorrectly linked the serotype of Escherichia coli to cucumbers imported from Spain, which caused to Spanish uh, industry or exporters more than 200 million dollars per week. Finally, the, the origin of this uh, outbreak was uh, identified in Egypt, which uh, came in from uh, exploited fenugreek seeds from organic uh, harvest, harvest, organic harvest of these seeds. And finally, this was the, the source of this outbreak. Another very, very important uh, scandal at European level was the very famous scandal of beef substitution with horse meat, is the denominated horse scandal. In this case, it didn't result in any health consequences to citizens, but it led to numerous controversies in the press and among, and among consumers concerning the, concerning the effect of horse meat consumption its nutritional, its nutritional characteristics, the confidence in food stuffs, and the frauds and ethic issues in food production. This was uh, very important at European level, and the European Commission reacted promptly for strengthening the system of control as a whole and food fraud prevention. Uh, another example that I will, that I can, there are huge uh, different examples that can be that can be summarized, but I only would like to highlight this more, the, the DOS in, in an ecological eggs with, with a clean, with a ecological production, uh, the adulteration of vodka with methanol, in, uh, not edible methanol, of course, in the Czech Republic, in Europe. Also. The presence of traces of radiation from the Fukushima uh, accident uh, in Pacific albacore, a tuna, a tuna species. And for example, the presence of uh, antibiotics in Pangasius, fish species, fern, 
in, in China and uh, Asian countries. So, mm, I, the conclusion of this slide, or sorry, of this presentation, is uh, that food identity includes not only uh, food fraud, include more items or more attributes like safety issues, ethics, sustainability, health, nutrition, convenience, because I only would like to, to uh, summarize the presentation, take into account that uh, the fraud, fraud, the substitution of one ingredient by another can have very important uh, issues in another, in another um, scientific, uh, in another uh, issues like ethics, sustainability and safety. It's very com Nowadays, the, the food chain is very complex and globalized, as I said before. One product came from South America, another ingredient came from China, and maybe all we are the food industry process in Spain, and this final product are are sold to USA or to uh, Africa and so on. There are a globalized, a globalized system and a globalized food industry. Anyway, you must take into account that food is safer today than in the past, for sure. But ensuring safe food has become more complex than another point in, the hist in history. And finally, a small mistake can ruin the good work done by, by some companies and the food industry. And that's all. This is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, you can, I think that you can do it by chat or maybe in the last minutes of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Our next speaker is Augusta Salis Junas. He is the CEO, founder and CEO of the company R21 in Lithuania. He, he is, a, as he calls himself, a serial entrepreneur and a business angel for uh, food and uh, agrotech uh, related business. And he is one of the partners of the EthiChain project. Uh, Augustas, whenever you want. Thank you so much, Elisa. Uh, good morning, good day, everyone. Depends on the time zone where you are. And uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, it was interesting first presentation I was listening to, and I think I will follow up my colleague on the food fraud and food authenticity later on in, in my presentation. And uh, just to give you a quick brief, uh, what, what I'm going to do is uh, I'd like to kind of overview the, the agri-food uh, digital technologies demand and industry in the world as it is right now and as it was uh, within the next like past uh, 10 years. Then I would like to talk about the habits of the consumers, about the, the governance of, of different kinds of countries and the necessity, and the way how specifically with the, with the ethic chain, the, the technology, the, the business models, what we are trying to create here, we can tackle the market. And uh, just, just a sentence about myself, as Elisa said perfectly, uh, past 15 years I've dedicated to the agri-food uh, technology development industry and um, as if to name uh, ARK21 which is, stands as the silver partner in the AT food. Uh, it's kind of like a private applied research and digital technologies development house. We're having the offices uh, not only in Europe, uh, meaning the Baltic states, the Balkans, but as well we operate in the Middle East, in NIDA region and in Southeast Asia as well. So it's kind of scattered, diverse company and uh, I think one of interesting things and the comp components or the model we are using is that uh, in ART21, we don't do sales. I mean, we don't have the sales office. So what we do really good out of those almost 100 people working here is we create the technologies and whether we use the, our partners, uh, big corporates and you know uh, companies with which we're working to bring the technologies to the market or we are uh, creating the technology on someone's demand and selling the intellectual property rights. So it's, it's purely, purely tech what we do. And I think we do it quite good. So if to get back to the food authenticity, food fraud, and in general, like the 
this topic and the trends coming up right now, I, I, I'd like to start by saying that I think the trends in general, they come and go in about the period of a decade. So, um, and, and this is what my topic is about. So digitalization and most probably now it's not enough. We need to talk about the value because if we would look past starting from, let's say, 2000s, it was a big hype about the internet. Um, I think everyone knows and remembers yet uh, the, the dot-com bubble, the dot-com crisis, which happened later on. So at the beginning, when the hype is starting, everyone is jumping there uh, because it's trendy, it's popular, and, and people yet still don't know what exactly to do there, but it's popular, so I need to be there. The attitude is similar like that. Then, uh, you know, 2010, uh, 2020, AI, uh, electric sustainable cars came up to the market, and, uh, you know, people also were jumping and tackling these kind of things to be sustainable, to be more smart, to live in more smart cities. And a lot of technologies were developed because the trend was there, but now we are starting to pick point not only that it's, you know, electric and it's good, but we are still getting back to the, our needs, uh, what we want to have from, from the technologies, from the, the, from the machines and to make it comfortable for our life. So I think that the term, the definition digital now came to a phase where if you're doing something digital, it's not enough. Uh, what, you, what you or we or we all together, we need to do is to create the value, uh, value for the customers, value for the society, value for the government, for the science and businesses as well. And uh, now just, uh, this is only one slide with the numbers. I, I'm not going to be boring today. But it's really important to understand how the agri-food tech was evolving uh, from 2010 to now. And uh, um, agri-food industry itself, within the past decade, meaning 2010 to 20, uh, I, I would be sure to say that it was the less, less digitalized industry in the world, even though it's one of the most prioritized industries in the world, because we all consume food, we need to eat, we need to grow it. We need to process it and we need to deliver to the to the society. So if to talk about the numbers in general to the to the tech of the agri-food uh, industry, within the decade it was gathered or sourced or you know pumped about 40 billion euro per a decade. Now interesting thing is that when coronavirus started and uh, the pandemics came up and, and the lockdowns came up. Uh, it, it's not surprisingly that the majority of people, because of less movement, uh, more being at home, they kind of turn back to the roots. And one of the main roots, it's a food. So uh, for the agri-food technology industry itself in the world, uh, the corona uh, was one of the main, main you know, explosions, financially, technologically, ecosystem building wise and uh, meaning uh, by the numbers continue on is that only 2020 uh, the third quarter uh, had gathered more than uh, 9 billion euro in a in a quarter in a three quarters of a year which is more than 20% of a decade was before so so this was kind of like the the snowball effect beginning for the agri food digital technology industry worldwide. And then uh, the more important is that when 2021 started, uh, only in one month, in a January month, accumulated investments to the agri-food industry, it reached 11 mils, meaning that uh, almost 30% in a month out of the previous decade which didn't happen to none of other industries in the world within the pandemic time. And uh, just now, uh, like a few months ago, uh, the, the, the Ag Fund report come up and they already have gathered entire numbers of 2021. And the numbers are colossal. I mean, uh, it's 1.5 times more per a year than per a previous decade of the investments into the agri-food tech. Why I'm saying this now, because we're not talking about the investment arena or economical uh, situation in general, but I'm saying that uh, today's webinar, uh, at the chain project itself, it's uh, in the right spot on the right time because the demand is coming up to the market. 
And by sourcing that demand, I think the, the level of success and probability to achieve the success with the technology, what we are developing in that chain project, I wouldn't say project, I would say the, the business development more because projects has the intensity to start and finish. Uh, in this case, I believe that with that chain, we will exceed, you know, succeed to bring the, the actual technology to the market and to showcase that it's feasible, it's important, and it brings the value as I was starting to talk uh, at the very beginning. So uh, numbers shows perfect match of, of doing these kind of initiatives, and, and, and I believe in that heavily. And uh, if, if someone would ask me to pitch how I see 2020 to 2030, uh, one of the definition which is in regards and in relation with, with our topic means food, uh, it's that people became food maniacs in, in, in literal sense of, of the, the meaning of that. Once again, I, I, I want to get back to the pandemic time and, you know, when we started to be a lot at home or at least isolated in one way or another, we started to think about our uh, habitats, about the way how we eat, about the things what we eat. And if we would look like uh, 10 years ago, uh, the definition of the diets would be like what? I am vegan, I am vegetarian and uh, pretty much it. If, if now we would source a list of the diet uh, definitions, I would say that there are more than 50 different kind of uh, types, what people eat, what they don't, what they prefer, what they not, uh, the way when they eat, uh, the way how many times per day they eat, and stuff like that. So, I mean, food becomes uh, an asset, food becomes a hobby, food gets back to the fashion again, I would say in this way. And, and that's why, uh, by understanding that, we need to think how we can exploit technologies to, to help the people who are kind of maniacing about the food itself, which is good. But yet again, uh, nobody needs technologies as themselves uh, purely. I, I believe that technology is just a tool to make our life easier, more happier, more satisfactory in one way or another. And then I come to, to another important point uh, where I believe is that uh, people, by getting back to the root that they love food, they, they want to customize the dietary you know, needs for themselves, another layer comes up uh, which says that uh, they want to know. And this demand about desire or a need to know everything about the food, starting from where it was grown, going to entire supply chain, people are crazy about it. And uh, this is also another weapon, let's say, in the, for the businesses to understand the society and to understand how it's possible to tackle it up. And uh, if we are talking about the fact that uh, people are spending way more money on... Um, on a different kind of food and, let's say, leveraging the, the higher scale of the food right now, uh, budget-wise, cost-wise, and stuff like that, then my previous colleague's topic about the food fraud comes in, in a perfect match because uh, I left, left all the examples, most of them I, I was aware about before, a uh, few more about uh, the issues of the food authenticity, I would say, is that, uh, and for the South Europe, I mean, this is one of the things you are so known in the in the world. It's uh, let's talk about the olive oil. And uh, statistically wise, for example, uh, seventy percent of all extra virgin olive oil, which goes to the states out of the Europe, uh, by the data of uh, FDA Food Drug Administrative Office, seventy uh, percent it's a fraud, meaning that uh, what what people or the companies are doing, they are lowering up the quality, so it's not extra virgin, or even they are sourcing the oil, uh, olive oil, not from the olive trees. And uh, the definition, I think the first time it was stated in Italy, on a 2018, uh, of a new crime organization types, which are called agri-mafia. So meaning that those criminal organizations which were involved in uh, drugs, weapons, uh, and all those bad things, they are kind of shifting themselves to more logistically easier way uh, 
to counterfeit the food products. Um, olive oil is one of the best examples because it's still kind of legal, but you know, instead of Spanish or Italian extra virgin olive oil, they are buying and bringing the stuff and labeling uh, the goods from Morocco and saying that it came from a specific region of Spain. So the problem is there for sure. And because people who are spending a lot of time, money and time to choose what they want to consume, they want to know that they are paying for a specific exact thing they are expecting to have. So, so we need to kind of tackle up the understanding that society wants to know now. And this is the power to them, but this is also a power to technology providers, technology developers. And if we do understand that, we can influence the habits for the future. So uh, this is also important thing I wanted to say. And uh, continuing on, uh, science in general, it's important to the scientists uh, and pretty much <laughs> that's it. But uh, if we are talking about empowering the science, and packing uh, the science uh, to, to, to bring to the market luxury technology or a luxury solution. I think this is the way how we're supposed to see the market from the development perspective and the business perspective itself. And this is really important because if, if we would be able to empower people, customs, uh, governments, to understand what kind of goods are actually coming into the market. So the knowingness of, of that information, it's already a big weapon. It's already a power. And in a way, it's a luxury. Specifically, if we are talking about the luxury goods or, or, or about the diets. And uh, once again, I mean, those who are spending a lot of money to the food products, for the food products, they are keen to pay more to satisfy the need of knowing. It's kind of like a part levels from the Maslow pyramid. So once people are getting to a specific level of that, they just want to know a lot and they want to influence. So, so this is the way how I, I see the, the future of that chain and the future of our collaboration in, in general in the arena. And uh, also it's important thing to, to, to think and to talk about the business models and what actually we are bringing up to the market by by developing a technology which can help to identify whether the food is vegan or a halal or a kosher. So one thing is to provide a specific result to the to the beneficiary or to the interested party. So let's say the customs, uh, food authorities, uh, supply chains. But the, another thing and I'm thinking about that, how to monetize it, is that we, as the, 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 the owners of the technology, uh, those who are bringing technology to the market, we are going to have tremendous amount of data. And we will be able to identify what kind of issues in specific regions, not even talking about the EU, because if to talk about, you know, halal, for example, we are talking about big market, big industry in the MENA region or in, even in the Asia region. So by, by sourcing a lot of data, we will be able to, to monetize the data, to give the data to the beneficiaries who would use it to exploit and to come up with another initiatives, another models, another products. So I, I think that we are kind of in, in a way where we are not only creating the technology by planning to bring it to the market, we are in a specific phase, we are creating the ecosystem by supporting those who need to know the data about their own area, region, organization. But from another hand, uh, we are supporting, you know, different interested parties, third parties, by, by providing the complex holistic data sets and, and data models to continue on with the future initiatives, future developments and future innovations. So this is what I believe in, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to, to go through with, uh, with all the partners uh, in this project. Thanks, thanks again. Um, giving the floor to the, I think, the last speaker, and we'll be happy if we'll have some time for the questions. So once again, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Augustus.
Okay, and the last talk uh, will be will be done by myself. So I am Elisa Jimenez from ASTI, a, a technological center in Spain. Uh, I have been working at ASTI since 2008, mainly in the development of DNA analysis methods. Uh, so the presentation will be mainly related to the project, the AEIT Food Ethics Chain project. So this project has, has the objective of uh, the, the development of DNA analysis systems for the authenticity of vegan, halal, and kosher food. And also to relate these, the, these systems to a digitalized syst, uh, tool. So, uh, as has been previously mentioned, in the last decades, there has been an enormous increase in food fraud issues, mainly related to the intentional addition of undeclared food ingredients, but in some other cases, just the, uh, the careless addition of them. So we have, in this sense, the food with ethical and religious implications, such as the ones mentioned, is not free from, from food fraud. Although there have not been many issues related to these food categories, we thought uh, it was well worth uh, uh, having a look at them to, to be sure that everything was under control. Therefore, in the last, uh, in consequence, there has been a growth in consumers' concerns related to, to fruit fraud issues. And also, as has been previously mentioned, a, an enormous loss of trust from the consumer's point of view. In this sense, uh, there, is, there has been a stronger demand for control. And as Augustus mentioned before, people want to no. So the consumer wants to know what is uh, in, their, in their plates. In this uh, context, uh, we are working, we, we think that there is a, a need to develop rapid methods to verify both the labeling and also the claims stated. And we also consider that it's uh, crucial to improve the traceability through digitalization. So we want to to work on these two areas together. And so we decided to start the ethic chain activity and got funding from EIT Food for, for it. So this uh, project has the main objective of developing these rapid portable methods to evidence the presence of uh, unwanted species DNA in processed foods with ethical and religious concerns. With this, we wanted to both to improve the supply chain transparency, but also very, really importantly, to gain, to help to, uh, companies to gain again consumer trust. So we are four partners in this project. So it's R21, a company in Lithuania, also Technion Technological Center in Israel, the University of Bologna in Italy, and ASTI Technological Center in Spain. So within the project, what we wanted uh, was to create screening methods methods that could serve only just to, to, to see what was happening in the foods, in the food categories mentioned, that could be easy to implement. So we wanted, uh, for this, we decided to develop uh, several DNA detection systems based on isothermal amplification. We wanted to detect animal DNA in vegan products pork DNA in halal products, pork and horse DNA and kosher products. These methods uh, have to be portable, 
easy to use and mainly easy to implement. They, they have to help the final user uh, just to, to see them as an easy uh, systems that, and that wouldn't scare them. And also, we wanted to be able to integrate all the results information into the company traceability system through a digitalized system. Furthermore, in this project, we decided to perform a food survey consisting on the analysis of a series of uh, vegan, halal, and kosher uh, food products traded in Europe and Israel, or by both in regular shops and also in online shops. Okay, as you, as you uh, all know, uh, the DNA-based identification methods are currently used as routine methodologies to control ingredients and monitor mislabeling and authenticity at uh, several levels, because DNA has several advantages over other molecules, such as uh, proteins, mainly related to the high stability, since they are more thermostable, uh, also, they, are, they show a really high sensitivity and are relatively easy to isolate. And therefore, they are really, uh, a DNA is really useful when dealing with processed foods due to the degradation of other uh, molecules, due to, to temperature processes and, and so on. So in this sense, the most, most Use, uh, mostly used uh, methods are the PCR-based methods, but these methods they require complex systems that uh, able to to perform several amplification cycles with really rapid alternating steps and exact temperature control. They are not portable, and they also need well-trained personnel. So in this sense, uh, companies. Uh, Trend, tend to outsource the, the to control of la uh, labeling by, by means of DNA techniques. So in this context, we, we thought that it, it could be really useful to develop rapid and portable tools that could be implemented nearly everywhere and could be used by all kinds of personnel. For that, we have focused on the use of uh, this isothermal amplification technique called RPI, recombinase polymerase amplification, which requires no thermocycler because uh, it's performed at a single temperature, at relatively low temperature between 37 and 42 degrees, that thanks to the combination of a series of proteins, the recombinases and polymerases, it's able to uh, rapidly amplify uh, the DNA when present, maybe in, in uh, between 10 and 30 minutes, you can start seeing a signal in 10 minutes. And it has also the advantage that you can monitor the fluorescence in real time, thanks to the uh, fluorimeter that is employed. This technique is very straightforward. It uh, has many, many advantages, since it's really simple to, to use, not so simple to in the design uh, step, but for the final user, it's really easy, and it's very quick. Also, uh, it's relatively low cost because there is no need of complex equipment and also really highly trained personnel, which is really important for this. And it can be, and it's obviously portable and can be performed on site in the, even in the production uh, plant. This, uh, the technology was described as by the group of Pippenburg, and here you have the reference below if you are interested in the technology itself. So for the detection systems that we wanted to create during the ethy chain activity, we focused on these three food categories. So for the animal 
DNA detection system for vegan products, we selected a series of uh, species that uh, could be uh, detected by the method. Also for the halal system, we focused on, on pork, obviously, and also for the kosher on, on horse. Uh, for the development, we, after the selection of the species, we selected uh, the, the most convenient uh, marker for each of them to perform the design of the primers and probes required for the RPI. Also, we, we performed the reaction parameters of optimization, trying to make the DNA extraction and the amplification the easiest as possible, just always having in mind the final user. And during the Ethitane uh, project, we have performed the, valid the validation of the systems internally in the lab. So as you can see in the screen, the, the fluorescence of the, so the, sorry, a positive sample would uh, show an increase in the fluorescence that can be monitored in real time. Uh, for this, we use a, a small and portable incubator and fluorescence reader that allows to perform the whole reaction in the same uh, system. Uh, and we, so it, with only an incubation of 30 minutes incubation at 38 degrees, you can have uh, the, the confirmation of whether there might be the possibility of having uh, the press of unwanted uh, ingredient or not in the product you are testing. So uh, within the project, we have performed the validation as mentioned. First, we did uh, the internal validation in terms of sensitivity, saying, uh, um, just checking that all the species of interest were being uh, detected by the systems. Also, the specificity, the, uh, taking into account other kinds of samples. We reached a level of detection of 0.1%. And also the reproducibility assays were uh, were extremely good. Furthermore, thanks to the help of other partners from the project, we have performed an external validation, optimizing alternative analytical methodologies to, to verify that the results obtained were uh, uh, were good. We have used a real-time PCR. NGS for complex matrices, and also a classic PCR with sequencing. So furthermore, we, we, dis, we decided to, to perform a food survey, analyzing uh, sever, several samples from uh, vegan, halal, and kosher categories, always processed samples, such as uh, burgers, sausages uh, and stuff like that, that could be uh, prone to have some uh, small traces or, or mislabeling uh, products. We collected samples from several countries in Europe and Israel. We analyzed 102 vegan samples from Spain and Italy, 42 halal samples from France and Italy, and 65 samples, uh, kosher samples from Israel. So the method that we followed for this uh, was first a DNA extraction of the of the of the samples using a, the Opera Mega system, followed by the RPI or real time PCR, depending on the on the partner uh, for the, for the categories for the ingredients mentioned, previously mentioned. And in the samples analyzed, we didn't find any mislabeling issues, which was very satisfactory. Uh, furthermore, in the, at R21, they have been developing an APP just to, to be able to digitalize the obtained sequence and, uh, and link them to the to uh, any final uh, user traceability, comp the company's traceability system. What we wanted was to be able to digitalize the results and furthermore, 
going further, we want us to create a QR code uh, communication, QR code based communication system that could help to reconnect both the industry and the consumer. With this, we wanted to help increasing the consumer trust, just uh, checking that the, the company, the product from the company they are, the, they are uh, consuming has made the whole possible effort to control the food they are producing or they are selling. At the moment, uh, all the specification and the design features of the and the content of the app have been have have been finished. Uh, they are just trying to, to finish the app because we want to perform a small pilot study involving stakeholders and consumers just to to see how how it goes to, to check the consumer engagement for these sort of uh, APPs and also check some user cases and functionality of the APP. So in conclusion, what we, we wanted you to, to know is that uh, the RPA detection systems developed within this activity are suitable for the identification of the species, target species mentioned in commercial processed food products or raw, in raw materials in a rapid and easy way. In this sense, it can be implemented as a routine analysis methodology in, at any step of the food supply chain. The most important thing and are that they are portable and allow on-site analysis. And these systems could be employed by control laboratories, producers, uh, or retail industries. Right now, we are in the process of finishing the APP to have it ready for the pilot testing. And we are also organizing an on-site validation of these systems, uh, both in control labs and industries, because we want to, to check the acceptability evaluation. Right now, we are in the process of organizing them, and we, we are contacting some companies to, to check the, the willingness to, to test these uh, systems developed. Furthermore, as Augustus was mentioned, uh, this has been conceived as a, as a future possible business. So right now we are evaluating the possibilities of production, marketing and distribution, have, uh, trying to, to get some uh, alliances with companies uh, for this next uh, future process. And I want to thank you all for your attention, and I will go to the go back to the to the sorry. I will go back to the chat to check if whether we have any questions. Uh, I might be wrong, but I I don't see any questions. Does anybody want to ask any question? Okay, anyway, you can contact us uh, later, the three of us, and we will be willing to, to answer you any questions that, can, might, that you might have. So I want you to thank you all for your attention and for being here today and uh, giving us the opportunity to present uh, the, the results. Uh, yeah, I can see a, a question from Daniel. Uh, his question is, what has been the most difficult organism to detect with your DNA approach? Uh, well, we the the most difficult uh, organisms it always depends on the on the design you make for for the primers and probes but we have had some we had some difficulties at the beginning with some uh, seafood uh, that 
that uh, were, were not initially detected, but we overcome that problem. Thanks, Daniel, for your question. Okay. Okay, so thanks, thanks, thanks to all for your attention. Oh, sorry, there is a question from, from Gemma. Oh, no, sorry, it was just thinking. Okay, Th thanks a lot for your attention. Bye. Thank you.